We have Vivek Ramaswamy with us right now, calling in. He is running for president, and he's doing a heck of a job so far. Vivek, great to have you calling in, my friend. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, how are you guys doing? We're good, man. So, so you were in Nashville yesterday. I want, I want to first, you know, bring him up to speed on the last twenty-four hours. We can get at some of the broader issues, uh, the indictments, the campaigns, all the things happening right now. But first. Tell me what you were, and tell everybody, what you were doing in Nashville and and what your purpose has been there. Well, my purpose was very focused on calling for the release of the transgender shooter's manifesto, period. I think that this is a shame that this hasn't yet been released, but it's typical of what's happening in the country where we have a government that believes that the people cannot be trusted with the truth. That tragedy, that tragic shooting of six people at Covenant School occurred on March 27th. In April, Governor Bill Lee and others gestured towards the likely release of the manifesto. We're now sitting in August. That manifesto has still not been released. And I think that's wrong because there's a longstanding tradition in law enforcement, whenever the manifesto is recovered, to release it, to help understand the most we can about a tragedy, to help prevent something like it from happening in the future. But my particular reason for going to Nashville this month, to Tennessee now, is that Governor Bill Lee then has the gall to nonetheless call a special session of the legislature to pass red flag laws and anti-gun measures without actually releasing to the public the essence of that manifesto. And I just think that's wrong. I think it erodes public trust. I think it reinforces this wrong belief that the public cannot handle the truth. And so I went there to say, on behalf of the citizens of this country, yes, actually, we can handle the truth. And so Vivek, Vivek, publicly, I've called on this show and in other forums as well for the release of the manifesto. My uh, my sense of it all along has been, and I'm sure this is a part of what's going on, that there would be some very troubling things in there from the perspective of the beliefs of this transgender terrorist and either... Uh, you know, quote, anti-trans laws that are being passed in different states or, you know, the right wing uh, conducting some kind of a, quote, uh, erasure of trans people. And and they don't want the public to see that. Right. That's been my um, assessment all along. Is there another component to this? I mean, now that you've gone right to the heart of this uh, of this debate and showed up in Nashville and tried to push for the release of the transgender shooters manifesto, is there a part of the argument that we're not hearing as much that actually makes more sense to you, even if you still believe it should be released. Yeah, I think that there is likely something else going on here. That's my strong sense. I think there were people who came from that community who are also against its release. But my view is, even if it's not my preferred political narrative or somebody else's preferred political narrative, we should not have preferred political narratives, actually. We should just be interested in the truth. America is founded on the truth, on a government accountable to its people rather than the other way around. And so even if the truth isn't that they are protecting some transgender hate crime against a Christian school, which is my base case assumption, you know, I think that having been there and on the ground, my sense is that may not be the story. But all we have now to do is to be left to guess. And I think that that's wrong. Now, one of the arguments that they sometimes use is to say that, They don't want to provide inspiration or a roadmap for people who can commit similar crimes in the future. I don't want that either. Nobody wants that. I think if there are details of a crime that need to be that need to be, you know, laid out, well, those can be redacted in the case of a memo that's publicly released. I'd be supportive of that. But nonetheless, we have to see at least the truth about the motives. We have to see the truth about what was behind this killer's motives. We have a mental health epidemic in this country. Gender dysphoria, I believe, is a mental health condition. We have to confront that reality. But a deeper mental health condition, if people pose risks to their communities, we need to deal with that in a different way than just removing guns from law-abiding citizens, which is exactly what Tennessee is on track to do later this month. And history teaches us that we make our worst policy decisions under conditions of a so-called response to an emergency when we suppress the truth. That's exactly what happened during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I see the same mistake on track to repeat itself in Tennessee, by the way, under a Republican governor at that. 
Vivek uh, Ramaswamy with us now. He's running for president. He's uh, showing up big already in some of the polls relative to the the other uh, challengers. And uh, Vivek, uh, did you? I don't know if you if you've seen this. So I'm kind of putting you on the spot, but I'm I'm curious what your assessment of it is. Uh, a lot of folks reacting to this David Samuel's uh, kind of magazine piece in Tablet, where he goes into effectively. Obama's actually calling a lot of the shots for the Biden administration. And this seems to pull together a lot of different threads, makes a lot of sense to me. What's your assessment of that and, and how it pertains to Biden going forward? Well, he, he, this actually is pretty relevant to my campaign. I'm a little bit outside the GOP Overton window here on this. My whole point is I think we need to stop talking about Biden, right? The party line is what the political consultants are coaching the candidates to do and every other candidate is doing. Is talking about the radical Biden agenda. My message is, folks, stop talking about Biden for two reasons. First of all, we have to actually talk more about an affirmative vision of our own. It was our failure to do that that I believe actually lost us what was the red wave that never came in 2022. But the deeper reason is the dirty little secret that Biden is not in charge. The people we elect to run the government are not the ones who actually run the government. That is the dirty little secret of modern federal government in the United States of America. It is the managerial class in the deep state. And if we're unwilling to wake up to that reality, then we're just going to swap out one Republican prep puppet for a, for a Democratic puppet. But it's going to be the still same managerial machine that runs the show. So the only thing I would say, and I haven't read the piece, but to, reacting to what you said is I think there's a temptation to then pin it to another one person, say Obama. It's not one person. It is a machine. It is a system that is bigger than any one person. It is the Leviathan. Okay, this is the Leviathan that Hobbes wrote about 400 years ago. It exists on modern American soil. It is the hollowed out husk of a republic that we actually live in today. And I think the more we talk about that, Clay, I'm leading the way in offering specifics, unprecedented detail on how we would shut down that administrative state, that deep state, and how that will stimulate the economy, how that restores accountability in government. That's how we actually win this election in a landslide. But the more we fixate on just talking about Joe Biden and offering poll-tested platitudes from Republican political consultants, the more we're missing the plot. And I think, by the way, the more likely it is we're going to lose the next election, too. Now, we are being told that any day now, and I think at this point, we, it's an assumption, right? It's not, oh, maybe there's going to be an indictment in Atlanta. I, I, I'd be shocked if it didn't happen, which would mean a fourth criminal indictment against Donald Trump. Now, you have maintained, uh, Vivek, that you are running to be president, not running to be Trump's vice president or treasury secretary or anything else. What do you think the proper response of the GOP, speaking of machinery, should be to, well, certainly three and likely soon four criminal indictments of your chief opponent in this primary? Look, there's a lot of people who want to hear me sit around and bash Trump. I'm not going to do it because, honestly, I think he was an excellent president. I think that his victory over Hillary Clinton in 2016 was probably the single most political, politically important event in my lifetime, certainly in this century, stopping the inevitable Marxist march throughout this country and our government. And so if you want to hear a bunch of people bashing Trump, tune into MSNBC. That's not what I'm going to give you, but I'm in this to move us forward. I would have made different judgments than Trump made, but a bad judgment is not a crime. And I think it is no accident that you are seeing three, now possibly four, but at least in the three that are out, novel, previously untested legal theories levied against one man in the middle of a presidential election. Come on, guys. This is politicized persecution through prosecution. It sets an awful and dangerous legal precedent in our country. Even that most recent indictment effectively criminalizing seeking good faith legal advice and a lawyer giving it, turning that activity into a so-called conspiracy with your lawyer. This is uncharted legal territory. It is dangerous precedents that shake the foundations of our legal system. And I say this as somebody who is now running third in the Republican national primary. It would be easier for me if Trump were eliminated from competition, but that would be the wrong thing for the country. And that is why I've been so forceful on this. And it is also why I've been crystal clear that when I'm president, and Clay, I do expect to be our next I'm president. I'm Buck. Clay's out today, but close enough. We Go ahead. Him. We will We will pardon him. What's that? What's that, Clay? I'm Buck. Clay is out today. 
It's okay. Oh, close gosh, enough. Gosh, gosh. <laughs> it's all right, man. Well, we sound we sound close yeah, enough yeah. that it happens with people. But um, tell me, it just, let's just let's get on to the, the, the immigration front here for a second. Because, um, you know, you've seen, I'm sure, I, I talked about it at length yesterday on the show. You, you've seen the uh, migrants who are out in the streets and, and the whole thing. Um, what would a Ramaswamy immigration policy look like? And, I mean, give me some of the, uh, please, uh, secure the border. Yeah, yeah, we know. Enforce the law. Yeah, we know. What, though? How? Yeah. So let me let me go quickly because uh, because there's a lot here. One is the wall is not enough. We must use the U.S. military to secure the southern border. We have 1.3 million men and women serving today, 700,000 more in reserve. That is plenty to secure the southern border, close the Swiss cheese of a hole. They're building cartel financed tunnels underneath that wall. It's the source of most of the fentanyl coming into this country. That's how we end it. Stop funding for fe- sanctuary cities. That eliminates the incentives. And further, stop a dime of foreign aid, any dime, to Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Belize, until Mexico itself has solved its own southern border problem. So that's how we solve the illegal migration problem. And then on immigration more broadly, look, there's a key North Star here. It should be obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway, which is that the purpose of our immigration policy should be what advances the interests of the homeland. What advances the interests of American citizens on American soil? I believe the U.S. president, I believe our government has a moral obligation to our citizens to ask what advances the interests of our citizens. And that would be what guides a broader legal immigration policy as well, which I have you know, lengthy views on, but that's the North Star principle that I would use. Vivek Ramaswamy, everybody, he is running. Um, Vivek, what's your site so people can see more about your policies and what you're up to? Vivek2024.com. That's V-I-V-E-K 2024.com. And as I say, if you want reform, go with somebody else. But I stand on the side of revolution. And so if that's you, come join us. Thank you, Buck. It's good talking to you. Good talk to you. Thanks for making the time, Vivek. 